Welcome, everyone. I'd like to introduce you to today's speakers. We have Terry Hill and Bob Schaffer today. Terry Hill has directed the center since its inception in 1990. He has over 30 years of experience working with rural health care providers and communities. Terry assumed the senior advisor for rural health leadership and policy role at the center last month. And he is also the executive director of Rural Health Innovations, a wholly owned subsidiary of the center. Bob Shaper is the chief executive officer of Tahoe Forest Hospital District, which is a two hospital system in Truckee, California in Incline Village, Nevada. The system also includes six medical clinics, a cancer center, a center for health and sport performance, home health agency, hospice program, occupational health services, retail pharmacy, children's center, and two community foundations. Bob has over 40 years of experience in hospital and healthcare administration. He's worked in both non-for-profit and investor-owned hospitals and health systems. And he served as the CEO for Tahoe Forest Health System since 2002. So now I'll turn it over to Terry to start his presentation. Thank you, Leslie, and, and welcome, everyone. Uh, this is part two of our Blueprint for Excellence presentation. Uh, during our last session, which was last Friday, uh, we went through the blueprint, uh, basically examining the various components. And in this session, we're going to drill down a little bit deeper into each of these components, uh, talk about tools and resources that would be available for rural hospitals. And uh, again, I'm really pleased to have Bob as a co-presenter here. Uh, again, what we found through our experiences in the Rural Health Innovation, uh, Rural Hospital Performance Improvement Program is that having uh, hospital leaders, uh, you know, co-present with us actually adds a, a lot of richness and uh, actually increases hopefully the value of, of the presentation. And we're all about value. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. We, we went into greater detail last time about talking about how the healthcare landscape is changing. Uh, again, don't be uh, fooled by the political environment, which is uh, seeming like everything is going to uh, fall off the edge of the cliff here. Uh, it's very, very clear that the healthcare industry is moving towards a value-based system. We'll talk a little bit about to begin. And then we're going to talk about how rural hospitals can adapt to the new system. Uh, I'm going to suggest even lead the change, uh, become innovators within that system, et cetera. And uh, again, it's give, giving you what we perceive to be the formula, a blueprint, for example. We're really starting to get into some of the resources, tools, and approaches that a rural hospital can use uh, actually to be successful in the value-based system and be successful in some of these critical success factors that we're going to talk about today. So um, our, our National Rural Health Resource Center, uh, you know, as, as Leslie mentioned, has been doing this work since the very early 90s. And kind of in that regard, uh, I have been in every state uh, and, and worked in every state that has rural hospitals right now. There are 47 of them. Um, and, and part of our role is to be a really good listener, to go into the hospitals, to, ho to talk to hospital leaders, to kind of interpret what are the issues, uh, what are the strengths, weaknesses, et cetera, and, and then to help translate that to the federal government. Uh, we have a number of federal contracts, and part of our role is to be kind of a go-to resource for policymakers for folks from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, who is one of our funders, from the, the Office of the National Coordinator, um, from USDA, et cetera. And uh, we're to help interpret uh, what the impact of potential legislation might be uh, to provide uh, kind of input to the federal government in terms of trying to uh, avoid uh, you know, a lot of, of, of negativity for, for, the, for the rural hospitals. And again, we're not always successful because that, that's just a huge challenge. But that's kind of our role. Uh, the other part of it is to translate what we are hearing from the federal government 
so that we can get that information out to our rural hospitals and clinics uh, to actually serve as a technical assistance center, kind of the national technical assistance center. And uh, what we're trying to do is to provide assistance, resources, tools, et cetera, that will help rural hospitals um, kind of achieve excellence and ultimately to be successful in this new value-based system. Uh, we, we're, most of our funding comes from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy and our Rural Hospital Performance Improvement Program has been around since, uh, well, ab about 13 years, right around, I think we started around the, the year 2000. So we've been around quite a while. We've worked with hospitals throughout the eight-state Delta region. And um, it's, you know, I think the topic of today is, is going to be very, very important. Um, one of the things we did in June was to bring people together um, from across the country, people like Bob, Bob Schapper, other hospital administrators. Uh, last week we had Rebecca Bradley from the Louisiana Hospital Association. Uh, you know, we, we, we had Brock Slabaugh from the National Rural Health Association, et cetera. So the, kind of the, the folks that we thought knew most about this whole concept of performance improvement in rural hospitals. And we spent a couple of days actually in Minneapolis and emerge with this blueprint that we're, uh, again, going to talk about today. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about that. But first, I wanted to uh, introduce Bob and have Bob tell you a little bit about his hospital, uh, which is located in, in, in California, but has uh, particularly been using some of the techniques that I'm going to be talking about. And, and Bob, can you tell us a little bit about your hospital? Uh, sure, Terry. Thank you for having me on today. Um, a tall Forest Hospital and Incline Village Community Hospitals, uh, both are, are two critical access hospitals. We're located in Northern California in an area, uh, Truckee is about 18 miles north of Lake Tahoe, so we're in a resort community uh, surrounded by a dozen uh, ski areas, so we're in an area of the largest concentration of ski areas in the western United States. And Incline Village is about uh, 20 miles to the southeast of us, right on the uh, northeastern shore of Lake Tahoe. Both of our organizations are what I would view to be uh, classically uh, small rural critical access hospitals. And what we uh, understood uh, here over the last decade is that we are working and living in a very recreational-based uh, region of California. And the, the consumers that we continue to engage with in providing services in our communities are, are very much made up of a, a variety of local residents to uh, visitors who are uh, recreating in our area, and so our goal was to look at this community from a, an eye of how to be a very high-performing health system rather than individual hospitals and begin to develop a strategy uh, around excellence that would allow us to translate value to our community in a, a more meaningful fashion than we had historically. And that's a little bit about our system. Thanks, Bob. And, and I just want to cite a few uh, uh, sources moving forward. That this, our June meeting was not the first. Uh, we've been holding these, these meetings on a kind of pretty regular basis. Uh, I, I spoke before, I think, last week about the great work the Louisiana Hospital Association had done, and Rebecca, Rebecca Bradley joined me last week. Uh, we also looked to the research organizations like the Rural Policy Research Institute. And uh, for years, we've been holding uh, various leadership summits on quality, financial performance, uh, et cetera. And then we also did a survey of the top, the iVantage top 60 critical access hospitals in the country uh, to kind of get the information and the recommendations that we're coming out with here. Uh, this is kind of an example of our leadership summit. It's kind of tongue in cheek here, but one of uh, one of our friends who participated in the 2011 leadership summit, which was held in Minneapolis in December, uh, came up with this picture, kind of. Uh, 
characterizing the, you know, kind of what a bunch of people sitting around in this particular case, it's, it's ice fishing, uh, kind of talking together and then coming up with these uh, very structured conversation and uh, the, the recommendations and, and uh, critical success factors kind of moving forward. Now, just from brief review, and I'm not going to spend any time on it, uh, basically the one of the reasons that we talked about last week that we've reached this point of, of, of absolute need for change is that the current business model has been based on volume. The more money uh, you, you make, the most money when you do the most procedures, et cetera. And we've had a lot of overproduction. I don't suspect there's been a lot of overproduction in small rural hospitals, but definitely in some of the bigger centers, uh, there are there's been a pretty significant amount of waste, you know, way too many tests, too much uh, medicine, et cetera, et cetera. And kind of partially for that reason, there has been a, a movement of the industry itself to this new model. And the new model itself, so despite what you might hear about the politics of it, what I can assure you is the bigger healthcare systems throughout the country are developing a brand new approach, um, and it's really towards what the Institute of Health Improvement has termed the triple aim. It's going to be better health, uh, which is population health. It's going to be better care, uh, better quality in terms of quality outcomes and the, our HCAP outcomes, patient satisfaction outcomes, and this is going to be accomplished at lower cost. So that's the challenge, and as we move forward here, uh, we're going to see that patient value now will be, will be measured by quality and, and service. Uh, and then very soon we're going to see population health and outcomes is going to be thrown into this model as well. And costs will be, obviously be a driving factor here as well. So we're going to have to reduce the, the, the cost of taking care of some of our sickest patients in particular and the role that rural hospitals are going to play will be uh, a part of, of what's probably going to end up being a much larger system, uh, and our responsibility is going to be serving the folks that are, are presently in our, our rural communities. Uh, we know how to do that better than the folks in Minneapolis or New Orleans or Memphis or Chicago. And uh, we also, I think, have the tools and the resources and the experience to do this effectively as well. In essence, though, we're going to have to get across what we're terming here as a metaphor, a shaky bridge, because critical access hospitals are currently being paid uh, on a cost-based basis. And um, the, the, the other rural hospitals are paid under a DRG system. In essence, we will move to this new payment system uh, gradually over what we're, we're expecting maybe the next four or five years. I talked a bit about that last Friday, but there's absolutely no doubt in our mind that that's the direction we're moving, and we're urging hospitals to think through, you know, there's no reason to rush across the bridge at this particular point, but really think through what could we do to prepare ourselves for, the, for this movement across the bridge? And what we're speculating here is what's across that bri bridge is going to be this value-based system and is going to be population health management, uh, which we're going to talk a little bit more about it. Now, we're going to introduce four different uh, what we think are, are tools and resources, <clears throat> all of which we think are, are very useful. Uh, one of them is the Baldridge uh, framework. Uh, we outlined that last Friday, but I'm going to talk more about that. And, and Bob has been dealing with this, this Baldridge framework in his hospital. A second is going to be there, there is a Studer group that uh, some of you may be familiar with Studer. I know some of the hospitals in our region, the Delta region, have been doing Studer. Uh, we're going to talk about Studer because Studer has approached us and said they're very interested in cutting costs and making Studer programs more available to rural hospitals. So I want you to know a little bit about that and uh, as, a, as a possible resource. 
uh, a third area really looks at the balanced scorecard, something that we've been doing here in our, our own organization for at least 10 years, and which a lot of rural hospitals are doing. We're going to talk about balanced scorecard and why we think it's important. And then finally, we're going to look at lean, which is a tool and resource that is absolutely going to be uh, extremely valuable in the new value-based system moving forward. So we came up with our own definition of a framework. In essence, if we want to move across that shaky bridge and we want to go from, from one system to the next, we're really going to require something like a framework. Uh, we're going to suggest Baldridge is a really good framework. And we suspect that Baldrige may be used by the federal government as the framework of choice w with their Medicare Flex program. We've recently had some conversations with them, and we've also had conversations with the, the Baldrige, the National Baldrige people, about designing a rural hospital Baldrige program. And so we're going to talk more about that as well. Now, the reasons we need a framework is, first of all, we are, we're very complex organizations. Even smaller hospitals are extremely complex. And it's really developed an organized process for leading and driving change. Uh, it helps to create a culture for change. It takes this broader systems approach. So we're not trying to do everything. We're, we're going to break this down into some core areas that we can reasonably do. Again, we've all worked with rural hospitals for years, so we've got a pretty good feel for how busy you all are and how many things you've got to do. So we're trying to be very realistic here, suggesting there's some things that may be a little more important than others, and even if you're not doing them right away, uh, think about you know, how you can start at least to be thinking about them. Uh, it, it, it supports quality reporting. Uh, it, it provides an opportunity to document your outcomes, uh, and it can help you make mid-course corrections. Our strategic planning, which used to be we do it three to five years, has now been reduced to you know, maybe six months a year out. So th this is going to help us be more mobile in terms of making uh, kind of mid-year corrections and just gives us a whole lot more flexibility. It, it'll align people, processes, and resources, and it's going to link individual department operations to organizational strategy. Baldridge is this systems-based approach. Um, it's really a blueprint for rural hospitals, and we're working very hard now to develop a specific Baldridge uh, approach and even a certification that some rural hospitals might want to take. But whether or not you're interested in, in going after a Baldrige Award or a certification, we think the framework is really ideal for kind of organizing your strategies and kind of monitoring your progress. It, it was the recommendation of our Quality Leadership Summit meeting two years ago, and it was the recommendation coming out of this, this new group uh, that met in June. So, it, I mean, the, the documentation of value is, uh, is incredible. It was actually created in 1987. Uh, it's documented a 200 to 1 ratio in terms of savings. Uh, in, it, 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 it wasn't until 2002 until healthcare organizations got involved. Um, 20 million copies downloaded. Healthcare organizations, basically, almost all of the big systems uh, in this country are using Baldridge at this particular point. You know, for example, the Mayo Clinic uses it, et cetera. Um, and we've, we've seen some really successful organizations using Baldridge. Uh, in 2011, they documented 820 to one economic return. And they've also seen that hospitals using Baldridge are seven times more likely to be in the top 100 hospitals uh, listed across the country. One of the things I'm really proud of is there were only four, you know, national Baldrige Award winners uh, last year, and I think three of them were were healthcare. You can see that North Mississippi Health Services won in 2012, which uh, you know, down in our region that that I'm particularly proud of. And the other one I'm proud of is because I'm from Alaska originally, but the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium won and. In in uh, in 2012, which was last year, the, uh, a native 
American health system actually was able to accomplish the, uh, the, the national award, which, which is really pretty incredible. Very, very successful uh, Indian Health Service. So basically, the, the framework itself, which I'm going to lay out here, is, all, is very much results-oriented. Uh, the core work really looks at the workforce and operations management, and it all starts with leadership, strategic planning, and customer focus. So our critical success factors are all arranged under those uh, kind of six core areas. The other piece that would be in here in the seventh is measurement, analysis, and knowledge management. So that's relatively simple looking forward. The concept is if we do the drivers, which is, you know, the, if leadership is, is there and we're customer and community focused and we do good strategic planning, our core work, we're going to have excellent people doing uh, very efficient operations. We're measuring and developing knowledge and feedback. We're going to have excellent results. So. Go, going into the, the components themselves, and I've embedded some of these tools into the presentation itself, but boards must understand and support this movement into uh, the value-based system. We're anecdotally hearing that boards it, it just aren't, in so many cases, are just not understanding that to, to continue to operate the way we operated five years ago, ten years ago, uh, is really not going to be, uh, is not going to lead us across that shaky bridge to success and to value. So we've got to do something there. The leaders and managers have got to understand and support this as well. Uh, there's absolutely essential that, that they be, that not, not just the, you know, the, the CC suite, the, you know, the, the director of nursing, the, you know, the CFO, et cetera, but it really has to get down to, to the manager level as well. And then we've got to, we're going to, primary care providers have got to be a part of this as well. So the value, the biggest value, here's the good news, guys, is the biggest value within this new value-based system has to do with primary care physicians, which is basically the kind of the life's blood of, of our, our rural hospitals. That is a huge asset for us, but it is extremely important that we either form those partnerships or, or really lock in our physicians uh, that we're going to be working with, either adding them to the board, uh, working out, you know, whether we're employing them, however that is, we absolutely uh, cannot work at cross purposes at this particular point. And one of the real dangers here is that a primary care clinic that has historically been admitting into a rural hospital could be bought out because, as I mentioned, the primary care physicians are going to be extremely valuable. Uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to go back, and, and Bob, you want to comment about, you know, kind of what your leadership team and, and how your leadership basically has been aligned behind Baldridge? Uh, sure, Terry. Um, I'm happy to. Uh, you know, Baldridge, um, when you sort of take the, your first look at it, if you're not familiar with it, can be a bit intimidating because it is a, uh, a very large initiative. So what we basically did in our organization as we looked at the, the fundamentals around uh, Baldridge, which were the, the core values and concepts, and we formed in our organization uh, a team to explore uh, the use of Baldridge. And this is going back now about eight years ago, uh, where we created a guiding coalition of select members in our group, included a board member, included a physician, and uh, key senior leadership. And what we found that was very common to our interest in healthcare, not just at Tile Forest, but I think across our, our universe of healthcare organizations, is that the core values and the concepts really resonated with us. Uh, if those of you who are not familiar with this, perhaps I can just read them off quickly, but it's the notion of supporting what I, I thought was mom and apple pie, visionary leadership, having a patient-focused excellence orientation, uh, organizational and personal learning, uh, valuing workforce members and partners, being in an organization that is agile, you know, being able to focus on the future and manage 
through by innovation as well as managed by fact and have social responsibility for community health as well as the engagement of our community and focusing on results and creating value with the system's perspective. Well, when we started to explore this information, we said, gosh, this, is, this just fits what we're all about as healthcare leaders and healthcare providers. So perhaps we can use Baldrige in a, in a manner that will allow us to create a framework for the work that we go forward in our organization. And what we found was that uh, it was just, it was perfect for us in terms of being able to simplify it and work with it in a meaningful way where we were able to create what we call our organizational excellence model. And what I would tell you is Baldrige organizations uh, sort of boast about borrowing from each other. And that's one of the things that I like very much about the culture of organizations that have participated in this. In my experience in eight years in California, I really leveraged relationships with the Boeing Corporation. They were tremendous leaders and uh, philanthropists supporting organizational excellence in California through our state Baldrige organization. And they were great role models for me and role models for many of us to, in their deployment of these principles, in, in their organization. And so we, we borrowed from them. We borrowed from Studer, where a Studer has pillars of excellence. But instead of pillars, we really felt in our organization, they were really more foundations for what we wanted to do. And it allowed us to take in and sort of approach in a very uh, pragmatic way uh, what was our organization's future vision? What were we really going to be about? How do we kind of collapse that vision into something simple and meaningful? In our particular case, in order to engage our community very much more than we had in the past, because we were, I wouldn't say typical, but we were viewed as being too isolationist in this community. Uh, we really set a goal that was a community-wide goal, but we wanted to be the best mountain community health system in the nation, and then established a set of values that reinforced that and created our foundations of excellence, which were around quality, service, people, finance, and growth, which is a common set of foundations that come out of Studer and other Baldrige organizations use that. But it was really being able to set a bar that made a very clear statement that said, we're going to provide excellence in clinical outcomes. So we're going to be the best place to be cared for. We're going to be the best place to work and practice. We're going to have superior financial performance. And we're really going to work collaboratively to meet the needs of the community. So that's how we, Terry, began that process about eight years ago. We've had our ups and downs with it. Um, but what we know, in, when you look at the Baldrige criteria, and you treat it as a framework that organizations really get better and better using the, the framework so you become more systematic in your, in your thinking. And the takeaway that I would love to be able to share for our organization is, is that when we get stressed, particularly stressed like we are now with all of the very substantial changes that are happening in our industry uh, as a result of the reform initiatives, it's really easy to get caught up and to get really frightened by all the dynamics that are changing in the marketplace uh, that, that all of us are, are feeling. Um, so I have a tendency to be able to, with our management team, sit back and say, all right, let's look at our vision. Let's look at what we're about as an organization. Let's think about the criteria that we have as a framework for us. And let's realign our thinking around our strategic plan Let's talk about how leadership is deploying our messaging, and let's uh, work more and more collaboratively to continue to inform and educate ourselves on where we're going, and how do we refine our processes, and how do we work with our various stakeholders to really refine that, that organizational vision so that it aligns more effectively and put initiatives in place that, that make sense for us. And it has a tendency to, to provide order and an ability to work through things in, in a much more structured and, I think, thoughtful process. 
Yeah, that's very well said, Bob. Um, in essence, it, it gets into our second sector, which is that strategic planning, which is really creating a vision about, as, as you've indicated, about you know why we are here, uh, you know, the service that we provide to this community, kind of where we are going, et cetera, that, that value piece as such. And then as you mentioned, uh, using this broader framework allows you to kind of organize all of these pieces. The concept is if we consistently fight fires one crisis to the next, we, we're going to be endlessly fighting these fires because one thing is going to pop up, we'll, we'll manage one thing, and then something else is going to come up. So this gives us this kind of a 360 view of, of uh, everything that's going on. And then, as you indicated, we can communicate this to our staff. So staff knows that, you know, electronic health records is, is not just about technology. It's about better patient care, better coordination, et cetera. So I think that's really very well said. Um, and, and again, we have extremely complex organizations, very, so managing a hospital requires, or leading a hospital requires this, this broader systems approach uh, just because we, the environment and our industry is going more and more complex. Uh, and again, one of my favorite, I mean, if you don't know where you're going, any road is going to take you there. So Bob basically is saying, you know, we come to these crises, should we do this or not, we refer back to our strategic plan and it gives us confidence moving forward. Uh, and this is something I wanted to share with you because it, it's actually coming out of some people who have really, I think, done some really incredibly good work here. Uh, Tim Size, David Kindig, and Dr. Clint McKinney. Uh, Dr. McKinney is, is the uh, Assistant Director of the Rural Policy Research Institute. And, and basically they're saying the healthcare markets are being redefined. We're, we're shifting from purchasing service units to purchasing quality outcomes. Uh, so the developing redefinition of the healthcare needs to be reflected in rural provider strategic planning. It's a great opportunity for rural health. Um, we are, we're taking a position, or I'm certainly taking a position, that there's a lot of pos positive things about where we're going here. Rural hospitals can change quicker. Uh, they don't have a whole lot of resources, but the change that they're going to be making is going to be easier than, than the, the great big systems who are driven by a surgery base specialty care model that no longer is going to be cost effective because surgery is going to become a cost center rather than a revenue center and primary care and, pop, and you know, keeping people healthy, uh, doing outpatient care in particular is going to be extremely important and it, it should be reflected in our strategic planning. Uh, this next section is the one that, that is probably going to be as challenging as any other. Uh, we've got to really, and we've entitled it Partners, Patient Care, Coordination, and the Communities itself. Um, the new success formula is partially based on uh, patient satisfaction scores. It is a huge factor in the new, there's almost, there are over 500 ACOs, accountable care organizations out there, and it is a key component of their financial reimbursement. Here. So even though if you're a critical access hospital, you're not affected by this at the moment, we all expect that uh, critical access hospitals along with other hospitals are going to have to be under the same sort of requirements sooner or later about the patient satisfaction scores. Uh, there, there is, we need to find a role in some sort of these, these larger networks. It doesn't mean we have to be sold. Uh, we don't have to give up. Uh, I, I think there's, there's models here where you don't have to give up uh, independence or local control, but you certainly have to, to look at collaboration. Uh, we're going to have to think more from a network basis, particularly if we're not a part of a system, and we've got to engage and educate the community uh, as well. These were some of the partnerships that that we came up with as we looked at this, we need to think about partnering with other rural communities. Uh, what is our relationship, for example, with larger health systems? Uh, you know, in, in Louisiana, for example, we've got uh, rural hospitals that uh, 
have uh, tele-emergency uh, coverage so that they, you know, they've got uh, emergency medical specialists that are helping to cover the emergency rooms. Telehealth is going to grow substantially. So let's think about that. Let's find out where it makes the most and best fit. Also within our communities, we're going to need to reach out just like the bigger cities in the smaller cities, I think, are the towns we've got an advantage. We may know the local um, mental health provider or the long-term care provider, et cetera. But because of the necessity of effective care coordination across disciplines, we're going to need to reach out. And those are things that don't cost anything to, you know, call a meeting within our hospital and talk to the rest of the providers in the community. And then we've got to engage and educate the community because, in, in effect, that piece is going to be uh, very directly related to our financial bottom line moving forward, and we'll uh, we'll talk more about that. Um, so, uh, th this is the kind of a critical access hospital formula for success, and and a good friend of ours, Eric Shell. This is his slide, and in essence, the formula for success now under our current system. Uh, and this is rural hospitals in general, um, is, is really about the volume. Uh, the formula for success, we did a financial summit meeting uh, in 2012, and this whole concept of volume was pretty unanimously agreed as key for rural hospitals. Not necessarily on the inpatient side, but on the outpatient side. And what we know is that a lot of folks in our local communities are leaving to get the care elsewhere. In Tennessee, for example, they did a study of all the rural hospitals in Tennessee and found that they were losing over 50% of their market was going uh, out of community and, in, in essence, for services that could have been uh, um, delivered in that, in that smaller rural hospital. So it's going to be about volume. We've got to build that volume formula up. And the good news is if we're losing a lot of, of the folks then we have this potential to keep these folks locally, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Why do, does out-migration happen? Uh, one of the reasons is that a physician who may not be tightly allied with the, with the hospital uh, may want to re refer somewhere else. Uh, we, we are very concerned that if we're, if, we, if we're not working closely with our local docs, we could be see more of these, out, uh, these physician referrals out of our local service area. Sometimes there's just, you know, and it's just something that we see throughout the country. There's a negative per perception of the local hospital. It, it's this uh, kind of rumors that get started and, and something happening which gets magnified in a small community versus a big city where, where there's not as much uh, connectivity. A lack of knowledge and understanding of local services we have done so many, we've probably done at least 100 community assessments, and we have rarely ever found a community that knows what the services that are in the hospital. It's the biggest kind of aha uh, for the hospital itself. They just assume that everybody knew they had cardiac rehab, but in essence, people don't. Unless they need cardiac rehab, they generally don't know that it's there. And then when they have a cardiac emergency or some family member has it, they, they may not realize that you have that service locally. Uh, inconsistent customer service and quality, again, that's almost like uh, the same negativity. And then lack of innovative ways to engage the community. We're going to suggest there's huge potential to engage the community, and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It's going to take some time and effort, but it's not a lot and that in essence we can keep more business locally, which is going to translate to better financial outcomes. And that basically, we, assessments are, you know, can be done. Part of the community health assessments that we do really asks why, you know, where you're getting your care and why aren't you using the local services uh, if, if you're going elsewhere. Uh, physician hospital partnerships I've already referred to. Proactive plan to change community perceptions, uh, you know, creating community councils, creating alliances. There's just been a lot of things that our organization has done in, with hospitals across the country 
that has developed this meaningful dialogue with the community and has really led to a lot more utilization of local services. Um, again, you don't need billboards or television spots, et cetera. A lot of this can be done locally through these community meetings, community outreach, et cetera. Uh, these are some of the things. Population health, we, we talked last time how this is going to be extremely important. Uh, we're not su suggesting that you're going to immediately be charged with responsibility for the care of a group of Medicare patients, for example, but we're anticipating that three, four years down the road, that is, is, is going to be a part of reimbursement formula for many, many hospitals. And examples that we've created here is create a hospital employee wellness program. It's maybe that idea that you've been putting off. It now makes good sense for two reasons. One, you're truly going to save money on your, on your health insurance costs. And secondly, you're preparing yourself for, ho for population health. Create a community council, hold community meetings, uh, marketing, uh, going out to community uh, you know, gatherings, kind of engaging the, uh, uh, you know, the local uh, uh, economic development leaders, uh, just kind of looking at one of the, the pieces that is going to be crucial three, four years out is going to be uh, health data analysis. So we're not suggesting you need an expert on that, maybe even three or four years down the road, but to some degree, population health is going to mean looking at this collection of health data and uh, developing some strategies for it. And you might want to, might want to be thinking about where you're going to get that, that sort of expertise because it's going to be crucial. Uh, Bob, anything else you want to say about the community side of it? Um, the well, the only, thing that, yeah, the only thing that I would add in my experience with the community here is that um, when we started working with the Baldrige framework and we began engaging community leaders uh, in a process that we called our, it was like a community health council, but we called it our leadership council, we were able to take the Baldrige framework uh, in, in our use of that model and be able to articulate where our organization was going very clearly and what it did is it allowed us to solicit support from various sectors of the community on very unique levels. It helped us to define that philanthropy is not just uh, having a fundraising effort but it was really about engaging the community and we started organizing community councils and we've defined philanthropy now in this community very differently for our health system where sure you're going to always have those folks and we're grateful for them who will write you checks but what we're really looking for is an engagement in the community on an unprecedented level that improves and, and enriches our volunteer programs it gives us the opportunity to have intellectual gifts and as a result of those activities, we actually were able to develop programming here that never would have been possible or even practical to think about. Uh, I think Terry mentioned early on that we have a, a cancer program here. That, that program is affiliated with UC Davis Health System. And it was through the, uh, the leadership in our community and the collaboration with community leaders and then the UC system that allowed us to put together partnerships that heretofore did not exist and has allowed us to advance innovation through an innovation center that had not existed. And that's all as a result of reaching out to the community and having the community be very engaged with us as part of our strategy, which was fundamental as part of the, the kinds of questions and, and foundations that are built under the use of the Baldrige as a framework. Uh, so we've had very good success in that, and uh, I, I really believe that framework helped our organization understand its value as part of our overall operating strategy. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point, Bob, that, that in essence is population health is something where you, you may very well be able to acquire foundation funding, or it's, it's an area that foundations and uh, federal agencies, et cetera. So you may want to look at, at things, particularly if you're early going into this, 
uh, there, there's going to be money available for a lot of this innovation, and, and this is one of the really key areas. Um, you know, Terry, if I could just add an example that was very tangible. You had, you had made a comment earlier about, you know, out-migration and um, how, you know, we, we do lose a lot of our market. I actually am recruiting an individual in our community who um, had, was not interested in supporting the hospital because he felt that he could seek and get better care elsewhere. He is actually the uh, volunteer director of one of our foundations and was the single most influential person in assisting us to get an academic center affiliation. And that was as we worked together in reinventing with other community leaders our, our vision for the future of healthcare in our region. So I give credit not only to the, the influence of the, the core values and the framework uh, that we've used, but also it was leverage for us to talk about we are we are seeking to become an organization that is a high performing organization using the Baldrige program framework as a, a as a model for our development. And folks who knew about what Baldrige was in industry, that perked their interest. They have no knowledge of what the Joint Commission is or HVAP, but they, many of our community leaders have worked in businesses where they may have had an organization that was familiar with the excellence associated with the Baldridge name. Wow, that, that's, that's a really good uh, perspective, Bob. Absolutely. B business, uh, again, Baldridge, any big organization would, would understand this if you've got leaders within your community. Uh, they, they also can be good resources. They might very well have used that framework in, in their own organizations as well. There are three other things, and I'm not going to have time to go into detail. I wanted to introduce them, offer some slides that I, I really am not going to have time to go through in any detail. But these are really, really good uh, tools and, and uh, kind of business approaches to creating value. Uh, one is the Studer Principles and Pillars, and I have visited probably a dozen hospitals that are doing Studer, and it, remarkable outcomes. I, I couldn't recommend it any more highly. Uh, in the past, it might have been something that was more, too expensive for some rural hospitals, and as I mentioned, we are working right now with Studer to drive the cost down significantly, so I want to talk to you about that. Lean process improvement and lead management, uh, absolutely some of the best things you could ever do. Um, we've got some tools and resources. Again, I've got some of these embedded here, but I don't have time to go into them, but do look at them. And it's one of those things that I absolutely guarantee if you use the right lean approach with organizations that have experience and background with rural hospitals in, in terms of lean, I can almost guarantee you that it's going to be way more than you're, you're going to get more financial back, uh, return on it than anything else I could recommend. And then finally, balanced scorecard, which we've been using here, as I mentioned, for the last 10 years, absolutely essential. So measurement, feedback, and knowledge management, basically we're saying the same sort of things. In order to gather that information and provide feedback about your process, it's really important to use a strategic framework, let's say life balance scorecard, to, or to use Baldrige's various indicators to, to chart your, your process. In other words, you need some sort of a, uh, you know, kind of a, a, a a road map, some, some sort of a, a scorecard to tell you how your progress moving forward because we can't wait for a whole year to look at our strategic plan. Uh, we're going to have to, time is becoming of such of the essence right now that we're going to have to make decisions more quickly and, and make mid-course corrections um, more quickly. And then again, we, we've got to start looking at uh, starting the latest basis for our population health stuff. Again, that doesn't have to be immediate, but kind of moving forward here, this is one of my favorite slides. We've got a ton of data and information in our hospitals. Uh, a typical effort basically is the red line here. 
we collect a ton of information and we don't use a lot of it to make decisions. We've really got to drive that to, uh, if we can possibly do it, you know, we may, we may not have a, the luxury of collecting a lot less data, although a lot of times we're collecting data we're not using and the feds aren't asking for, the state aren't, isn't asking for. So really try to make, separate that world, you know, that tons of data into the most crucial pieces, again, that would be associated with your Baldrige framework or your balance scorecard. And so the balance scorecard basically is, is just a way of linking hospital operations to strategy and monitoring and comparing hospital performance, and it, it's going to help us with our strategy. Uh, it's not just a benchmarking process or uh, a magic bullet. It's really about change and kind of recognition. It's not a metrics project. It's, it's a change process. So we recommend Balance Scorecard. We have a ton of resources here at the center. If you'd like more information, uh, et cetera, that's, that's basically what our center is committed to doing, our RHPI program, is finding resources and models out there. So we have a ton of stuff on Balance Scorecard. Again, four different perspectives, financial, customer, internal business processes, learning and growth. These are just some of the examples of, here's a strategy map. Um, again, don't have time to get into that at this moment, but these are all examples of, of rural hospital balance scorecards that have been very successful. Here's, here's again, color-coded, et cetera. Our workforce and culture really gets this, it, it, you know, we, we need to be change ready and we really have that to have that intense focus on staff development and retention. Studer basically uh, sets up this commitment to excellence. Uh, it, it builds culture around excellence and it is a process, it comes from the book, Hardwiring Excellence. Uh, again, th there's a lot of different pieces to it, but what, what we can see and what we observe is that it substantially improves our patient satisfaction performance uh, and it, it also uh, improves our, our staff satisfaction as well, both extremely important here. And I highly recommend it to you. Again, ask Leslie if, if you're interested in any of these resources and we will keep you uh, updated on our progress on creating a, a specific rural hospital emphasis for the Studer program. Uh, the efficient processes really get into, uh, you know, business processes, operations, clinical processes as well. And lean is an extremely useful concept here. Uh, and again, lean is something that virtually every major uh, organization other than healthcare and in small rural hospitals have not used lean anywhere close to what they, they could be using it. But organizations across the world use, use lean. And where we've seen it really make an impact in, in our Delta region, we've seen huge improvements in financial performance, uh, emergency department time uh, significantly decreased, uh, just huge improvements in, in patient satisfaction, et cetera. And it's really all about effective problem solving. It does not have to be expensive. Uh, there's just a lot of, of ways to, uh, to, to play this out. Again, we've got resources available. Ask for them. It's also we've used Lean in our RHPI program uh, quite a number of times as well. It buys us time, productivity, capacity, and it is the CFOs will love this because it's really all about saving money as well. Uh, this is an example of, of you know it's uh, it's NASCAR pit crew again. Uh, it took in. In 1950, it took 240 seconds to change four tires and 22 gallons of gas, and but it, that had been reduced to 12 seconds in 2004. And I don't even know what it would be today. It'd be it'd be less than that. Um, it's all about improvement in the processes. Absolutely important in the value-based system as well. So here's an continuous improvement cycle. 
Uh, our electronic health records get put in here as well, and I, I really like this quote, at best electronic health records can hardwire quality. I know it's been a hassle for, for virtually all of you. Uh, we, we've never seen a rural hospital that did this effortlessly, but we really think that at its best, I mean, keep that goal in mind as you're moving forward here. And then document, report, and communicate outcomes internally and externally. Document value in terms of cost, efficiency, quality, satisfaction, and population health. And those pieces, we think, are absolutely essential. Bob, I'll, I, I kind of went through that stuff pretty quickly, but I'll, I'll kind of uh, leave, you know, you have some of the final comments on this, and then we'll show our, our um, our addendum that I think Leslie is going to put up here as well. So I'll turn things over to you. Well, sure, Terry. Thank you. I just wanted to comment for those who are interested in exploring the framework. Uh, I think that uh, Terry uh, put put out just recently an excellent document, and it's up on your screen: the blueprint for performance excellence. And uh, I. I'm exceptionally impressed, particularly with Appendix A. Uh, I think that is, uh, if you just look at Appendix A uh, alone and use that as a tool, it really lays out the, the basic elements associated with the organizational profile uh, that is, is very easy to assimilate for organizations like ours, and it really gets you on your way in terms of beginning to uh, Sort of work with the categories in Baldridge to help put together a systematic approach. So I want to compliment Terry and the center. Uh, I think this uh, uh, this document is is just outstanding, and for an organization like ours who has been working with the criteria and the, uh, created a framework for a number of years, um, I think uh, what Terry has done so well here is to sort of cut through the challenges of the scale related to trying to take on Baldridge and really simplified it. And I want to compliment everyone who, uh, uh, you know, on your team, Terry, who, who helped to put this together because I think it's, it's just a great uh, tool for us to take and begin to work with. Yeah, and, and in essence, it's been designed for rural hospitals. So, you know, we get a lot of stuff off the Harvard Business School uh, shelves and, you know, really good stuff. You can read really complicated books about balance scorecard or whatever. This was really designed to be something that could be comprehensive. Uh, it, it's only got, you know, maybe about 22, 24, I think at the most. I think it's less than that, somewhere around that different uh, critical success factors. So it really does give you some feeling of, it might be something you might want to share with your board, particularly the uh, that, uh, that Appendix A, as Bob is saying. Uh, it, it'll, we've, we've got some other assessments in there, so you could chart your progress. Uh, our intention is to embed resources. I just started talking about some of these tools, but, you know, leadership assessments, uh, you know, kind of the primer on, on what lean is, how to do lean. Um, it, within each of these sections, we will have and will build additional resources moving forward. So we're not just saying this is a checklist. Our intention is for you to be able to come into our center, uh, our ruralcenter.org, and be able to find useful tools and resources. Uh, we'll continue to find folks like Bob and other hospitals out there that you, you, you that you could call and, um, you know, just kind of uh, pick their brain and ask them about certain aspects. We'll continue to profile um, hospitals within the Mississippi Delta region as well. And so hopefully uh, this provides the framework for our RHPI program. Uh, we believe that we're moving towards this, perhaps within the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy uh, in their Medicare Flex program, not as a requirement necessarily, but just as something that helps to frame some of these really important things kind of moving forward. Uh, so 
with that, I think we've come to the end of our time, and I really want to thank you, Bob, for, for being a part of this. Uh, as I indicated, Bob participated in this uh, summit meeting, uh, the Rural Hospital Excellence Summit meeting, and uh, along with, as I mentioned, other hospital administrators, hospital association folks, state office of rural health folks. So in essence, you're the folks that I, I appreciate the, the kind compliments, but this actually came from the folks that are in the field kind of doing this work. So if it's useful, I think uh, most of the credit falls to the people that uh, actually participated in, in this production. So thank you, Bob. And I want to thank everybody that's participated in this program as well. Uh, do contact Leslie if you want copies of that Appendix A, the full report, or anything else that we can do. Uh, again, I want to acknowledge our, our great crew here. Uh, Bethany Adams, Rhonda Barkas, and, and Leslie Quinn, uh, who always do a, a fantastic job of, of helping